Thank you very much, Wickham. And indeed, thank you to Daniel and all the organisers. It's um, it's very exciting to be here. It's, it's an honour to be chairing this panel. Um, what I'm going to do is I'll give a little bit of background first on, on trauma, no longer than, than, than a minute or two. And then we will uh, introduce our guest of honour, Lloyd Kaufman. We'll talk for a little bit. And then after about half an hour or so, we'll open the floor. Uh, not literally, but we'll uh, open open it out to discussion. Um, so if anybody does have any questions, please feel free to put them in the comments and um, uh, our moderators will, will get to them and filter them through to me. So when typically when people think about American independent cinema, they tend not to think of toxic superheroes, surf Nazis or chicken zombies. They should, though because such novel ideas are the product of a 45-plus-year-old, fully independent movie studio by the name of Troma Entertainment. And whether the tastemakers like it or not, Troma is the product of the Ivy League, well, sort of, founded in 1974 by two university buddies hailing from Yale University, no less. Michael Hertz and our guest of honour this evening, the inimitable... Lloyd Kaufman. Now, as Lloyd himself has argued, um, Troma produces movies of, quote, an unusual nature, which, let's be honest, is an understatement at best. Now, Troma's legacy is best captured by its current tagline, which is 45 years of disrupting media. And whether it be through films the studio has produced itself from, I mean, there are so many, The Toxic Avenger, Class of Newcomb High, Terra Firma, and Poultry Geist to the many titles it has over the years acquired for distribution, such as Blood Sucking Freaks, The Children, Graduation Day, Mother's Day, and so on. Trauma has not just swam against the tide of popular culture, but a sort of human cannonballed into the middle of it. So I'm very happy that I get a chat with Lloyd about the history and future of trauma for a little while today before opening the floor to questions. Hello, Lloyd Kaufman. How are you doing? Great. Thank you, Johnny, Dr. Johnny. And what <laughs> an honor this is to be with Wickham and Daniel and uh, uh, Northumbria, too. Well, thank you very much for being here. And it's also nice that you've brought Toxie's head along as well. Um, oh, there's uh, Toxie. You're right. I can it's see him. He can join in if he wants. Um, <laughs> also, so one the movie, by the way, that's a uh, publicity head which I use personally to embarrass my family when we're on trips to places like Tunisia or Yemen. I put that <laughs> and then ride a camel or something. My family. I would, I would love to see that. Woke. Um, okay. So what, what we'll do is I'm going to stop, not quite at the beginning actually, because um, you know, I don't want you to get bogged down too much <laughs> on the earliest days of, uh, of trauma but I do want to start in the late 1970s into the early 1980s, before the Toxic Avenger dropped and before history, as we know it, um, changed. So you've said on numerous occasions that unlike the likes of Roger Corman, trauma has never really responded to mainstream hits. You've never gone out of your way to replicate a popular big hit like Corman did with um, with Carnosaur in Jurassic Park, for instance. However, you were operating at a time when there was a lot of lucrative independent genre films being made after Halloween and whatnot. So I guess I'm wondering, was Trauma in any way inspired by that very vibrant, buoyant time of independent commercial filmmaking? Uh, I think Troma, who started uh, in 1974, Michael Harris and I uh, began the company. Uh, so we're into our 48th year of uh, movies of the future. <laughs> started 48 years ago. Uh, at any rate, the, uh, the point really is that I, I don't care to work with stars. I'm a narcissist, and it's all about me. It's about the director. Uh, being an, uh, uh, how do you say it? What do they call it now? Uh, um, um, enlightened, empowered? No. Uh, and some nasty word they call uh, uh, bourgeois. 
at any rate, uh, uh, I speak French. I learned it as a <laughs> world at home and in summers in France. So I could read the Cahiers de Cinema when I was at Yale. The Film Society had a huge stack of these magazines. Nobody read them, except I read them and uh, got brainwashed by the auteur theory of filmmaking, which states that the uh, it was propagated by Jean-Luc Godard and Chabrol and other post-war French journalists transitioning, uh, uh, not to women, but to uh, filmmakers. And um, I mean, some of them may have transitioned uh, to women. Uh, I, I'm not quite sure. But um, the uh, point was I bought into the fact that the the auteur theory requires the heart, soul, and brain of the director to to overpower the film and to be the soul of the film. Uh, and I stupidly uh, bought into that, uh, which is why I decided, uh, thanks to my good friend, uh, LSD, uh, when I was in my last year at Yale, I had two job offers, one to work on a Barbara Streisand movie and in LA, in Los Angeles, and uh, one to work for a crappy little company in New York, and uh, I chose the crappy little company in New York because I thought it would uh, force me to be uh, true to my artistic ideals, whatever they would be. So, so what I, met John, I met John G. Avelson, who uh, was a great friend for 50 years and, uh, and a, a very important influence on my, uh, my oeuvre, as we say. Now it's incredible because you know my experience of trauma was in, in in the video store and being sort of lured in by by the lurid box art and whatnot. At the time, I mean, you know, not that I knew anything about Kaya du Cinema then, but certainly I think it's fair to say that not many people would associate trauma with that school of, of thought. But what you're saying is that well, you embodied it to a degree. Is that a fair assessment, or are you, are you being facetious? Oh, that's a very that's a very fair assessment, and um, you know, unfortunately, uh, Michael Hers and I were making movies of the future. Uh, every time we made a movie, uh, for example, before Toxic Avenger, we made Squeeze Play, uh, was a satire, a raunchy satire, uh, uh, concerning the women's liberation movement and the Equal Rights Amendment, uh, which never did get passed in the United States. And uh, it dealt with serious issues, but it was a raunchy, uh, sexy, uh, and and uh, the credit. Oop, oopsie, sorry, uh, the Russians did that. The uh, the, uh, the um, you know a lot of people turn their nose up it because it was so raunchy. It was before Porky's and before that genre of a uh, of, uh, of movie became popular. So, so we made three or four of those, all of which had. Uh, basically interesting themes uh, or serious themes, but we, we, we want to show satire and uh, maybe uh, try to make a slight uh, difference with young people, get them thinking a little more than just uh, fluff. I think, I mean, that's, that's incredible because nowadays, you know, it's, it's commonplace for, for certainly for academics to, to explore popular genre filmmaking as works of satire, uh, as you say, you're saying that you 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 always you set that you set out to do that from the beginning. From the outset. Well, you know, uh, 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 Trey and Matt, Trey Parker and Matt Stone, uh, when they uh, they hadn't finished their first film, Cannibal the Musical, uh, they came to us first, and uh, they thought we were uh, able to give them money. And of course, we're always uh, running on the memory of fumes. Uh, and uh, so we told them we'll go to all the other companies that have money. And uh, you, may, you should be able to make a deal. Uh, well, nobody in the, in the mainstream understood Cannibal the Musical. It's great satire. They didn't get it. They're too stupid or too afraid of losing their, whatever it is. I don't know. But uh, cannibalism wasn't in vogue uh, then. Uh, so they, uh, Trey and Matt came back to us. We finished their movie, helped them finish the thing. And uh, it's one of our better successes. Uh, and and uh, they, in my opinion, Trey Parker and Matt Stone were able to take the trauma graphic satire with the sex and violence or cartoon violence um, and uh, and transform it to a uh, trans uh, uh, translate it into animated uh, which uh, is not as objectionable and uh, they've uh, i think uh, at least from what i see Trey and Matt have totally uh, brought back the american satire and uh, what you see today i think is a big big uh, result of you know these marvel movies and these uh, 
you know, these kind of movies that high five themselves um, are trying to, uh, I, uh, you know, imitate Trey and Matt, but uh, most of them don't quite work, except for Guardians of the Galaxy. <laughs> Hashtag Suicide Squad. Made by Tom alumni. <laughs> yeah, so. Um, no, sorry, James Gunn. Although a lot of Troma alumni uh, did work, uh, well, they worked for James Gunn. His editor, Fred Raskin, started with us on uh, Tromeo and Juliet, and his, uh, be his uh, best friend, uh, you know, he met the, the people who he met on Tromeo and Juliet, he is still working with today. Which is inc incredible. And I guess, you know, a testament to, the, to, to Troma's place in history as well. Um, I, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about New York, actually. Yes, because, New York. Yeah, because um, nowadays New York is, for better or for worse, certainly certainly within cult film communities, mythologized on accounts of uh, you know Forty Second Street and the Grindhouses and, and and all the rest of it. Is it? Could you comment on on that and to what extent, perhaps, that environment? impacted on in any way trauma and your own mindset as sort of a, a rebellious filmmaker? Well, um, except New York for me was a way to sort of put blinders on myself so I wouldn't be um, seduced by uh, trying to work my way up the food chain. Uh, you know, you have these uh, Yale uh, law school graduates Xeroxing papers at uh, agencies in Los Angeles and kissing ass to, so they can get up the, to uh, wherever they want to get. Um, I, I didn't want to be distracted by that. You know, that's a lot of noise. And uh, also all this uh, pitching and uh, I, I, I don't care for it. And I have no interest in stars. <laughs> and the, uh, the industry is works on uh, who's in your movie and how much are you spending? That's uh, the two most important things in the mainstream industry. So, and also, um, the suit doesn't want to get the suit, who is the gatekeeper, doesn't want to get fired. So, Toxic Avenger, Cannibal the Musical. Now we have a hashtag Shakespeare Shitstorm. Every time we make a movie, nobody will touch it. And then the public slowly uh, finds it. And uh, like Poultry Guys, Night of the Chicken Dead, which is a kind of a musical with the. Uh, zombie Indian chicken, American Indian chickens. Um, and it deals with very serious subjects, uh, but it's hilarious. Uh, and um, it ended up uh, not uh, getting uh, uh, applauded originally, um, although the New York Times gave it a good review. But for the most part, theaters didn't want to play it. And then uh, it started getting good word of beak and uh, poultry guys, the uh, night of the chicken <laughs> became uh, uh, successful. It takes time. That's the problem. And we have no money for advertising. So we have to depend on word of mouth. And luckily, we have a great fan base. And you mentioned Roger Corman. Um, he, the movies that he directed are wonderful. And I, 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 they did prove to me when I was uh, uh, 19 or 20 that one could make uh, really great uh, movies on low budget with provocative scripts and interesting themes. And um, I've been friends with Roger Corman for 50 years. And uh, he and Julie actually are executive producing a, uh, a documentary, which one of my daughters is uh, making about a certain narcissistic uh, independent filmmaker. <laughs> who, who, who could that be? 48 year old, <laughs> disgusting company. <laughs> Amazing. So they're, wonderful. they're wonderful. They're wonderful. And, uh, you know, uh, 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 and clearly his films have, have inspired me, without a doubt. I just don't use the... Uh, well, actually, when he used those stars, they weren't stars. And um, we, we uh, sort of the same thing. Uh, we have in introduced people like Eli Roth and, and uh, Samuel Jackson and Paul, the late Paul Walker and uh, you know, there quite a number of people who started in our movies, Vincent D'Onofrio. But I didn't, you know, not, have no interest in... Uh, in, 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 I'd rather have somebody who looks like a fast food worker for, for poultry guys to somebody who looks like a, a high school student uh, rather than use uh, Taylor Swift or <laughs> You know, with those stars, it's always going to be Sarah, uh, um, whatever her name is, the one who's suing Disney. 
right? It's, you, you can't look at the movie uh, Black Widow, that's she, you, it's the star. You can't, you yeah. can't, it's impossible, especially with these goofy uh, $200 million movies. Uh, I think James Gunn has solved it though. He, he Somehow he manages to make the material much more important than the uh, people who are acting. Well, and I guess that, that, comes back, that comes back to the whole notion of, of sensibility and being true to oneself, which, as you said, you know, yourself and trauma seems to embody. But I, I, I'm just thinking, you know, you talk about Coleman and, and his success. Trauma strategy strikes me as so different and so crazy and unique, yet you are still here making <laughs> moves. It, it like defies business logic almost, but you are exclusively reliant on, on word of mouth and whatnot, yet here you are. How, how can that be? Well, uh, luckily we've acquired a, a, a very uh, avid and aggressive and hardworking fan base. So we look a lot bigger. We only have about 10 people who work for us full time. And by the way, we paid them all during the pandemic, uh, which is more than uh, the mainstream companies did. Uh, uh, so so uh, our, our fans do a lot of the work. They find us theaters, they find us um, uh, uh, music, or they write music. Everyone on hashtag Shakespeare's shitstorm, there are about 100 people who worked on that for two months. Um, they all were fans, and they came from Japan, Australia, uh, Great, uh, uh, Great Britain, uh, uh, France, uh, Japan, uh, Australia. I mean, they came all over the world on their own dime. Uh, the, the, the director of photography was from Denmark and, uh, uh, and they all were there because they want to make something uh, they, they can believe in and something where they can experiment and uh, something where um, they will never forget it. And uh, they may have to sleep on the floor and learn how to defecate in a paper bag, but it's a, it's a very uh, interesting uh, experience to work on a trauma movie. And uh, uh, now we're able to uh, rely on our fans to keep us going. That's kind of the secret weapon. And that's that's awesome. so we look like a big, to some extent, we look like a big corporation, uh, which we're not. Well, it's interesting that you, that, you, that you say that. It's because, you know, trauma, I mean, your branding is very potent if, if that's the if that's if that's the right word no you're um, right and toxi is is f always been front and, s and center of that so if we can just go back to the toxic avenger and i appreciate you've, you you will have talked about this a hundred times but trauma became trauma for so many people when the toxic avenger came out and it became that underground success can you talk a little bit about how you put that film together and what your aims were making it, if, if you had any aims? Well, uh, yes. Uh, and oh. and uh, I could talk for hours on it. Uh, uh, we wrote a book, uh, James Gunn and I, called All I Need to Know About Filmmaking. I learned from the Toxic Avenger. Uh, we had made uh, a bunch of these raunchy movies, the first turn on, Waitress, Squeeze Play, uh, a number of them. And uh, eventually uh, the studios caught on, uh, the big companies, and they started playing uh, unfair. They used good scripts and good actors. So we had to move on to uh, something else. And um, Michael Hers read a headline in uh, one of the trade papers uh, suggesting that horror films were no longer uh, a cash cow. So he said, okay, that's where we're going. We'll do a horror film. And uh, I, I, like uh, comedy, so um, I try. I eventually took a long time to figure it out, but I'm a big Frankenstein fan, and I always wanted the, uh, you know, again, I'm 75 years old, so the stuff I watched as eight, as a 13-year-old uh, or 10-year-old or 15-year-old were, uh, you know, the Universal horror films. Uh, we didn't have uh, <laughs> Texas Chainsaw Massacre or or the uh, class of Newcomb High to look at in those days. Uh, so finally, uh, I wanted the monster to live, and uh, I realized he should be a good guy, a hero, and uh, uh, the, uh, my wife and I would go camping a lot, and everywhere we went, there was some kind of McDonald's garbage. It wasn't biodegradable in those days. There was some always trash, no matter where we went. 
And I uh, remember seeing a frog uh, that was hopping along with this, those plastic things that hold beer cans. So you can have six beer cans. And uh, it, somehow its foot got uh, stuck in it. And uh, it, it was, you know, I can't, it probably would have died if I hadn't have uh, stepped on the frog and crushed it to death. <laughs> no, that's not true, actually. I'm a, I'm, that's not true at all. I'm a big animal rights uh, fan, but I, I do have a dark, I kind of enjoy the idea of, of, uh, of, of, of kind of, well, I, I prefer the, 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 the death by uh, a malted milkshake machine or, uh, uh, you know, pizza oven or uh, gym uh, equipment, uh, kind of benign things. <laughs> the birds, you know, the birds. It's you know, we've got rid of three quarters of all the birds in the world during my lifetime. They're totally benign, they're harmless. But uh, meanwhile, Hitchcock makes them. You know, these, these are terrible creatures. Wonderful. All of his, his uh, many of his deaths are uh, from uh, benign sources. <laughs> it's it's funny because when when I saw Toxic Avenger for the first time, it, it was on VHS. And I think a lot of people saw it on VHS for the first time. And around about that time, there was a lot of people saying that video is going to it's going to kill the cinema yes. and all the rest of it. Did did you feel that way at the time? How do you feel about? No, oh, that's ridiculous. The MPAA, which is the American version of your censor, uh, is owned and operated by the major uh, conglomerate, the major uh, uh, oligopoly. And uh, they use the same argument. Whenever there's new technology, they try to put a monkey wrench in it. So when VHS came out, they said, oh, we're going to lose copyright law. It's going to be useless. And, and we're going to have a tsunami of, of, of pedophilia. And uh, the world is ending. <laughs> and uh, they tried to stop it. And uh, we uh, got into it right at the beginning. We luckily uh, uh, got in with Vestron, who prove to the world that um, horror films can work. Uh, the Toxic Avenger was the first movie of that type. It's not a horror film, but uh, they were selling it for $200 a tape and they sold a, a two or three million, I think three million. Wow. <laughs> and of course, we didn't get any of that though, but uh, so what? Uh, <laughs> we got some, we got enough to stay in business. Uh, <laughs> so um, the, the point is that uh, you know the new technologies. Eventually, the uh, the mainstream uh, uh, takes over the new technologies, and eventually, Blockbuster, which was owned by uh, Viacom, which owns Paramount and MTV and CNN and all those terrible things. Uh, well, they're not terrible. I, I don't mean that. Um, and they uh, Blockbuster killed all the mom and pop shops. And uh, a monopoly never works. Never works. Uh, eventually, it uh, it implodes. And of course, uh, Blockbuster went out of business. They were horrible, horrible people. No question about it. They, well, they the Blockbuster. Oh, thanks to Blockbuster. What's that? I was just going to say thanks to Blockbuster. I saw that's where I saw Toxic Avenger for the first yeah, time. Your Blockbuster was different. Uh, yeah. your Blockbuster was more franchises, where the owners really they wanted to have a, a variety of films, which was the way to make money, not to have fifty copies of uh, of one movie and no copies of of uh, Terra Firma or Tromeo and Juliet. So uh, in England, uh, we did okay with the Blockbuster. I did some appearances there where nobody showed up. It was fabulous. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I, would be, I would have been there. People did show up, actually. Yeah. <laughs> Forbidden, Forbidden Planet in London is a wonderful uh, store, by the way. I, even when I'm not appearing, uh, I go there and uh, see what they've got. It's terrific. I well, buy I think yeah, go on. The, UK, the UK, like, I don't know, has a special relationship to trauma, I think, insofar as that, obviously, our censor for so long was, was so notoriously censorious. In, in, in The Toxic Avenger, well, Nukem High, a lot of your movies did not fare well with, with the censor. So I remember when the internet was a thing, trauma had a real presence on the internet and was, of course, reissuing unrated versions of, of of those of those classic movies and around that time i seem to remember trauma you were acquiring a lot of films to to redistribute to to to, to reissue films for the dvd age films that you didn't produce originally like the children and graduation day and stuff and i just wonder could you talk a little bit about trauma 
not as a producer per se, but as a as a distributor of of other people's movies. Like, where is where is trauma in that in that matrix, if you like? Like, what what was trauma's purpose? Well, uh, uh, it, 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 if it, if you want to call it a business plan, uh, our idea from the start was to acquire a library of movies that we owned or controlled. Um, you know, Charlie Chaplin, uh, even though he was uh, falsely accused of uh, various sins and kicked out of the United States and uh, you know, treated miserably, uh, he died a very rich man because he owned his negatives. Um, Buster Keaton, arguably uh, just as brilliant, uh, ended up being ruined by the uh, MGM suits uh, who uh, wouldn't let him, after the general, they wouldn't let him uh, have total freedom, uh, which is pretty stupid. Uh, and of course, they ruined him both his career and his uh, his uh, mental state. Uh, so um, we wanted to have a library. And that paid off because when uh, the VHS came in and the studios balked and sued uh, the VHS uh, makers, the, um, the public was uh, loving it, loving the VHS and uh, these stores, they were, they were all, they, thousands of video stores opened up and uh, they had to fill up their shelves. They would have taken the Dr. Johnny Walker uh, sex tapes and they would have been all over, they would have paid millions for that. And uh, just kidding. They, they, uh, well, they do, they, they do pay millions. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so, so, yeah, so we, I was, we were lucky because we had a library back when uh, video cassette came in. We had maybe eighty films, so you know they would they and they needed uh, movies because the majors weren't ready for this. Uh, so we were uh, they were taking us to lunch for quite a while. That's and amazing. Then, uh, of course, eventually the uh, blockbuster took it over, and that was the. Uh, the end of the gravy train, uh, the gravy train, at least uh, in that that era, but uh, it was a very interesting period, of, and we distributed, a, uh, we helped them finish it. The redneck zombies, uh, these young men came up from the south. Uh, and they camped out in front of our building until we came to the office one morning, and they're there with a knapsack full of redneck zombies that wasn't quite done. So we agreed that we would finish it. And uh, and we, we they shot it on three quarter inch video, and it it, it, it I, as far as I know, Redneck Zombies was the first uh, movie to be distributed uh, to the public on uh, video cassette video, uh, where you know that it was shot on video and no theatrical and no uh, uh, only only uh, a videotape, and again it looks different, and uh, but uh, it proves that. Uh, if you have something entertaining and uh, kind of uh, meaningful, uh, the public will support it. No matter, even if it's on toilet paper. But uh, <laughs> the majors are always a little bit slow to. Although I have to say, uh, they are a lot uh, cleverer today because they've been able to kill off. At least in my country, they've been able to. The uh, oligopoly is uh, able to uh, destroy all the uh, anti-monopoly laws that we exist, and now they're coming after net neutrality on the internet and uh, and YouTube and Amazon are in there with them trying the logarithms in my uh, opinion are set uh, against independent movies uh, and uh, not set for the same uh, uh, you know they'll pull an independent movie off the air even if it off of uh, YouTube even if it's been there for 10 years we had put all our movies hundreds and hundreds of movies on uh, on uh, YouTube for free and uh, uh, about eight years later, they started, they closed our channel for community standards. And our fans went nuts. Our fans went crazy. And 48 hours later, YouTube put the channel back. But uh, Michael Hers would have none of it. And that's when we moved everything to Troma Now, which uh, is an excellent, uh, it's the Netflix uh, that Netflix should be. Uh, and uh, it's great. It's got every movie, it's got about a thousand movies and shorts and documentaries uh, and trauma now uh, I, a lot of people think it's better than Netflix and probably is probably more uh, movies and, and entertainment from the heart music videos and collectibles people get dates on trauma now do they not, really yeah yeah they meet each other and uh, not just dates but sometimes they get an occasional nectarine or a dried uh, prune you know. 
question. <laughs> That's just a sample of the witticisms that come out <laughs> after the Shakespeare's Shitstorm, which is based on uh, Shakespeare's uh, The Tempest, my favorite uh, Shakespearean play. Well, you're an Ivy League man, so you know it's it, it goes without saying, really, that uh, Shakespeare should be you know thrown in there yet again, and 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 it would and it would throw a movie. I mean, I do have what you've you've touched on an area actually that I that I would like to talk a little bit more about. So this will be my I think my last question, and then we'll we'll open it to the to to, to the folks online. Um, you're talking about algorithms and YouTube and the state of play today with independent movies. I mean, do you think what you've just described is the biggest threat, as it were, not, not just to trauma, but, but to independent movies everywhere, this sort of net neutrality idea. Well, um, net neutrality has been a great, uh, um, well, the internet is the last, was, I should say was, I used to say is, but it was the last democratic medium. Uh, I, I made a little documentary called uh, Independent Artists Versus uh, Corrupt Cartels. Uh, it's only about 10 minutes. You can see it on Troma Now and on our free uh, Troma Movies channel. And it very convincingly shows you how the, the uh, YouTube and Amazon are, um, are removing uh, independent films uh, whereas uh, for um, sex and violence or community standards. But uh, movies that have serious violence, um, uh, I mean, my God, the stuff on Netflix and... Uh, uh, and Amazon uh, that uh, is permissible is, uh, you know, there's a lot of porno on it. I just saw, it's a wonderful series. Uh, um, uh, Judy, what's her name? Julie Davis. Uh, she wrote uh, 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 something to, to uh, oh crap, forever, somebody forever. Uh, it's, it's got much more sex than uh, trauma could ever have. It's very good. In fact, Julie Davis is uh, one of the leads of uh, the Toxic Avenger Reimagining, which is uh, currently uh, being shot uh, in Bulgaria. Uh, Could you so, talk a little bit more about that, please? Because uh, I, the, the people need to know. Well, it Toxic looked really great. I went over to Bulgaria and a uh, uh, nice 20 hour trip. And uh, my back is, I have the most excruciating back pain. So. Uh, but Bulgaria is a lovely country. I, I would go back. It's one. It's landlocked, but it's beautiful and a, a very good food, very inexpensive, and obviously a good place to make movies. They've got uh, you know labor that knows what to do and a good studio. At any rate, the movie is um, they're wrapping up pretty soon. Uh, it's got uh, um, Peter Dinklage playing the Toxic Avenger um, and uh, Kevin Bacon. Uh, so now I'm only one degree from Kevin Bacon. <laughs> That's amazing. And the guy who directed and wrote, uh, Macon Blair, a uh, fabulous young uh, uh, director who loves trauma. Um, I'm, I, uh, the script is better than the original Toxic Avenger. Casting Peter Dinklage, who is a wonderful actor, as Toxie is brilliant. It's a wonderful stroke, takes a lot of guts and... Uh, 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 Congratulations to legendary uh, films and Macon Blair, uh, who's a very good uh, writer, director. If you've seen The Green Room or uh, Murder Party, uh, uh, he also acts. And uh, Elijah Wood is in the film. Uh, a lot of interesting people. Uh, and they're all very nice. Taylor Page, uh, who stars now in Zola, uh, has got a big part. Uh, a beautiful young kid named... Uh, uh, Tremblay, Trum, somebody, Tremblay, great kid, we're full of beans. His father is a huge Stroma fan, uh, and uh, I, a good, great kid. It's going to be a good film. And Macon Blair, uh, Macon uh, uh, brought home the bacon, uh, as you know, so uh, it's going to be, I think it's going to be really great. I, I you know, I wouldn't, uh, I, I, we got lucky, I think, very lucky. Well, he brought home Kevin Bacon by the sounds of things. <laughs> What's that? I was just trying. I was riffing on Kevin Bacon having the surname Bacon. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, you got Bacon and Bacon. The Bacon yeah. directed only one movie called "I Don't Want to Live in This World Anymore," and it's wonderful, very original. I can't imagine it was a huge hit, um, but Elijah Wood is in it, and there's a, a TV star, female TV movie star. Uh, they're, they're terrific, and it's a great movie. Uh, 
but it's it, you know it's quirky. It's not, it's uh, clearly a work of art. So uh, I think Toxies. I think the uh, reimagining. Uh, uh, it's going to be a good remake, a good uh, reimagining, a good reboot. Uh, you don't go to jail for making a good uh, sequel or reimagining, right? The sound. Uh, um, the Star Is Born uh, with Judy Garland and James, uh, whatever is Mason. Uh, third iteration, right? All Quiet on the Western Front. The silent movie, okay, but the, the sound movie, much. I mean, the Evil Dead 2 was better than Evil Dead 1, and they're both brilliant. But, uh, you know, all these fanboys who uh, poo-poo the uh, remakes. And <laughs> if things go right, uh, Uncle Lloyd, gets a big check so I can make <laughs> a movie. Because uh, right now the uh, cupboard is bare. <laughs> well, I, can't, I personally can't wait for it. But, Lloyd, the questions are streaming in. So if you don't mind, um, can I ask some? I'll just ask some from the... I've got a little private chat here. Hopefully this will work. Okay. By so, the way, uh, yeah. shout out to Vera Dika, who worked in 1976. She was, uh, I think, the uh, continuity director on uh, uh, in, on uh, Squeeze Play, uh, which was uh, uh, our first real success. And by the way, nobody wanted to play Squeeze Play. Not one, and this is before video cassette. Uh, not one theater. And then uh, uh, we had a sneak preview. Somebody convinced uh, our sub distributor in Virginia convinced uh, theater American multi cinema. It was just the beginning of the multi screen uh, movie theater, and uh, they gave a, uh, they had a, a, a how do you say it a sneak preview uh, over the weekend, and uh, <laughs> it was huge. It was enormous. And the following Monday we had uh, over a hundred theaters in AMC American multi cinema who wanted squeeze play. Unfortunately, uh, we had no money to make prints. So we had to slowly uh, uh, bootstrap the making of prints. But we ended up with a couple of hundred of squeeze play prints. So uh, it's the That's same with every movie we make. That's amazing. But That's we amazing. got lost because of the, the multiple, the multiplexes uh, need, needed movies. And uh, so we got lucky. Uh, they were, were, you know, if we had something slightly commercial, they would play it even if it was uh, uh, unconventional, and then of course all that stopped when the uh, the um, the uh, uh, not oligopoly the duopoly of a of, in our country there are only two theater chains. You got the same problem. Uh, every country's the same. Yeah. Well, Darren Burroughs has a question about the film Mother's Day. Yes. He says, uh, and I'm quoting verbatim. What are Lloyd's thoughts and memories of Mother's Day? It's a very underrated film, in my opinion. Uh, Mother's Day was a masterpiece. Uh, my brother, Charles Kaufman, wrote and directed it, and uh, Michael Hurst and I were associate producers. So it, it has, uh, and my father and mother are in it, and uh, my sister was the art director, Susan Kaufman, and it's Eli Roth's favorite uh, uh, horror film. It's not a horror film. Again, it's a it's a wonderful satire, and it's beautifully written. You have things set up, and their payoffs, and I mean, it's it's it is a it's. I would say it probably Mother's Day's and Death Death by Temptation um, are probably, are, in my opinion, our two best movies. Death by Temptation, uh, Samuel Jackson's first movie, uh, all black people. Uh, again, it wasn't finished, and. Uh, uh, in fact, I replaced Ernest Dickerson. Uh, he had to go somewhere. And I uh, did the uh, final, I was the director of photography on the final climatic uh, scenes. And uh, I remember for years I was paranoid that Ernest Dickerson would see my shitty lighting and uh, be upset. But uh, he said it was okay. So, In fact, I interviewed him for one of my books and he was rather pleased with it. Well, that, that film's somewhat of a classic. Well, Death of Temptation was a, uh, a movie of the future because it, you know, the black movies were ignored. Uh, it wasn't popular. It wasn't uh, a la mode until Boys from the Hood came out. The video stores were afraid of taking in uh, uh, movies uh, because they were worried the black people would come in and burn down their video stores. Uh, so we didn't. Uh, Death by Temptation, although it was theatrically successful uh, on a modest scale, uh, the um, video stores w wouldn't buy it. And uh, then Boys from the Hood came out. Columbia was able to powerhouse it into video stores. 
and um, uh, again, a much more violent and 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 uh, not as beautiful as Death by Temptation, uh, but uh, it was a huge hit. But Death Temptation was uh, ahead of its time, and uh, and Mother's Day the same thing. Mother's Day initially was a tough one, but um, it did it did turn out when it came out. Um, uh, we didn't distribute it when it came out because uh, we all we got a big advance from. Uh, uh, United Artists Cinemas, uh, which, no, United Artists Distribution, which was a, a spinoff from the old United Artists and, um, the, you know, the uh, Monopoly. And uh, they took full page ads in the uh, New York Times and uh, and it, was, it became very successful. But it was uh, X-rated when it came out, of course, unrated, you know, as was uh, a lot of our movies when they came out. Unfairly so, unfairly so. Well, I mean, it's clear from what you're saying that you know you have a lot of love for the for the, for the films that you that you've made and and distributed, but also you point to the fact that trauma is not a one trick pony, and the catalogue is quite diverse. In fact, um, so we have a question from Steve Jones on this topic. He says trauma has such a distinctive filmic voice and champions the idea of remaining true to one's artistic vision. So of all your films, which do you think best captures Troma's ethos? Well, a great question. Uh, and you uh, only have one. <laughs> well, right now, I mean, I usually um, believe that the most recent film <clears throat> is our best. And hashtag Shakespeare Shitstorm uh, certainly is the most, uh, other than Terror Firmer, um, uh, the two of them are my most personal movies. I mean, I play Prospero in, uh, you know, I, I waited to do, I would have done The Tempest before Tromeo and Juliet, but I was uh, too young. I wanted to really be able to feel what went on in The Tempest, which is all about losing power and uh, getting old and uh, being banished. And uh, I can relate to that since I'm banished deeper and deeper into the bowels of the underground and I'm getting older and Prospero was a, a studied magic. Uh, I've been making movies for almost 50 years, which clearly is a form of magic. So um, the, 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 the Tempest really, I think is probably my most personal movie. Although Terror Firmer, which is loosely inspired by uh, all I need to know about filmmaking, I learned from the Toxic Avenger, uh, my uh, memoir made in 19, uh, James Gunn and I wrote it in 70, in uh, I think 94 or 95. Um, uh, but but uh, hashtag Tromeo and Juliet, I would say. I hope uh, I hope it can play in England uh, so, or in, in uh, UK somewhere, uh, maybe the Deptford Theatre. or uh, We have a couple of theatres that play our movies. Awesome. Fant fantastic. Well, so yeah. university. Why don't you uh, book it into the uh, university? Uh, have a, we'll have a trauma weekend and uh, the commissioner, my wife uh, was uh, one of the producers of hashtag Shakespeare Shitstorm. She was uh, commissioner of movies, of, of not a film, but of enter filmed entertainment for New York State for over 20 years and uh, was appointed by Republicans and uh, Democrats. Well, and, and Come over. We'll come over and uh, meet you face to face and uh, have a trauma weekend. We have no, some I'm sure we could do something like that, to be fair. Yeah, let's do it. I'll, I'll pay the airfare. That's all right. Um, uh, I can, you know, we can deal with some London. You know, by the end of it, I'm sure I can break even. But uh, the, uh, the um, my wife is great. She's very charming. And she was, uh, as I say, one of the producers of, after she retired, she produced hashtag Shakespeare Shitstorm with uh, two of my former assistants, Justin Martell and John uh, uh, Brennan, who now, by the way, produce a Shudder. I don't know, do you have Shudder over there? Yes, we do, yeah. Shudder's most popular show in America is uh, Joe Bob Briggs, The Last Drive-In. It's all trauma, all, everyone who works on that show, from the producers to the directors to the art directors, they're all uh, trauma alumni. <laughs> and it's, uh, uh, um, they, uh, and of course, they've been showing some trauma movies um, but um, it's, uh, the reach of trauma is pretty amazing. It's just uh, we're not uh, really, the mainstream media kind of ignores us, unfortunately. 
It is a t- it's a tremendous story, but in all seriousness, let's pick up that conversation after this. And we've got another we've got another conversation or question rather from Neil Jackson, good friend of mine. He says, as a New York City independent in the seventies, do you Lloyd have any memories of crossing paths with the colourful likes of Michael and Roberta Findlay, Sean Costello, Jamie Gillis, etc.? And then he says, keep it legal. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, uh, well, the Finleys, um, I, I met Roberta Finley a couple of times, um, and uh, but I never worked with her. Um, but you have to remember, this is an age of, uh, this goes back 50 years ago, almost 50 years ago, and uh, she, um, you know, women had almost no opportunity to uh, write and direct movies. And... Um, uh, but I don't, I didn't really know her. Uh, I didn't know her. I didn't know she had a husband. Uh, Jamie Gillis I worked with and uh, Caleb uh, Emerson, uh, who was, uh, who worked on Poultry Guys, Night of the Chicken Dead, made a movie uh, that Jamie was in and I was in uh, called uh, Die You Zombie Bastards. I think it's coming to Troma now. It's very good. Fantastic. But really, uh, I did. Uh, uh, I I hung out with the Warhol gang when I was at Yale, so I I got to use some of their superstars in Battle of Love's Return, and uh, also uh, I got a job uh, early on on a Silent Night, Bloody Night, directed by Theodore Gershuni, with Mary Warnock and, and Patrick O'Neill, and uh, a lot of the Warhol superstars were playing um, uh, lunatic asylum residents. Uh, so I got to know Candy Darling and, uh, and uh, sorry, and uh, 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 who were the other ones? Uh, uh, I can't remember the names now. But, uh, there were a bunch of them that in those days were, uh, you know, relatively well known thanks to uh, Warhol. But I was a big fan of Warhol, so I hung out there. Uh, who, the guy who answered, uh, Neil, uh, did Neil uh, hang out in New York in those days? Or? Well, I can say, I can say 100%, no, he didn't. Because <laughs> 42nd Street, before it was uh, uh, ground zero for porno, uh, we used to come down from Yale. The New York Times used to list uh, uh, the films that would be shown in the uh, 42nd Street grindhouses and they were movies by John Ford and Howard Hawks and Tay Garnett and, and Samuel Fuller. And, and we'd go through the Times, the New York Times once a week. And we'd, oh, my God, Tay, uh, Tay Garnett's uh, Play Dirty is playing on 42nd Street. You know, they'd play one day. And we'd go down there and uh, Robert Edelstein, my Yale roommate, we'd go down there. And, uh, uh, you know, the people in the, uh, a lot of the customers would go in the theaters to sleep or to uh, get heat. And uh, fights would break out, and the, you know the, the uh, people. One night, uh, there was a guy running down the aisle with a fire axe, chasing another guy. Uh, very exciting. In addition to the movie, but um, they, we were able to see these wonderful films up on a big screen. And then the porno thing came in, and uh, that was even better. I mean, uh, I've never seen a porno film, but. Uh, <laughs> Well, in, in very much in that vein, uh, we have a question. Well, sorry, the, the, the name's in that vein. The question is not. So this is a question from an individual um, describing themselves as Big Dick Black. Um, that, can't, that can't be true. And the question is, wanted to, he wants to know Lloyd's thoughts on this. Before Wes Craven's Scream, Trauma released There's Nothing Out There in 1991 which was a meta slasher with the character of Mike constantly making quips about the tropes of the slasher genre, helping him survive. Something that Scream is regarded as having pioneered. Any thoughts on that, Lloyd? There's nothing out there? Uh, well, um, uh, it has nothing to do with my mental capacity. It's uh, a wonderful film that we had nothing to do with making, uh, uh, but it's very good. What can I say? We, uh, we got lucky enough to uh, acquire it. Again, our strategy was to build up the library. So, uh, you know, we've got an enormous uh, quantity of movies now, most of which are really independently brilliant and uh, very entertaining and uh, 
a very under uh, underwatched. Uh, they're really uh, gems, many of them. They're precious, and uh, there's uh, nothing out there is is very very good, and uh, it never got its fair fair. Uh, but I would encourage you to watch it on Troma now. It's really really good. Yeah, I think we um, we all need to go out there and get Troma now or we'll subscribe to it for sure. Yeah, by the way, the first month is free, and you can see it through Roku and. Google, whatever it is, and uh, Apple movies, and there's four or five. The app, Troma Now, you can get the app, and then you can go see it, or you can watch it on your, uh, your laptop, uh, watch.troma.com, if you don't want to go through uh, Roku or, or the like. Well, it's interesting that you mentioned app creation. Now, we are approaching the end. We've got a couple of questions uh, left, if you'll oblige. Of course. Um, we've got Victoria uh, Timpanaro, who has a question. She says, having been part of indie film since the dawn of VHS and having its own experiences with online platforms, what will be the next phase of indie horror distribution? Is it app creation like trauma? Well, um, <laughs> I, the, the, based on... Uh... Uh, the past being prologue, as we say in, in, in the Bard's words, uh, the, um, the, the picture is not very uh, positive. Uh, uh, Troma is really the last of the independent uh, distributors. Uh, there aren't any uh, that I know of. I mean, there are always new ones that come and go, but they they can't survive because the the uh, the deck is stacked against them. Your countries, France, Italy, China, Japan, uh, they're all um, oligopolies at best. And, uh, and, and the governments in many countries, like Portugal, where we just made a movie, um, the, the government and one or two companies control the entire market. Um, so it's virtually uh, almost impossible, I think, to start a trauma today um, you know, the, everybody talks about how great the internet is, but um, if, if net neutrality goes away, uh, then uh, we're all going away. There'll be just, uh, you know, Marvel movies and uh, CNN or whatever, BBC, maybe. maybe. Um, so uh, it uh, doesn't look terribly optimistic. And my guess is that, uh, uh, you know, somebody will, when I throw off these mortal coils, uh, uh, Michael Hers, uh, uh, well, he, he at some point will expire. Uh, probably some conglomerate will buy the uh, collection and uh, have a, you know, we just don't have the resources to to penetrate a large uh, hymen of the mainstream. Uh, and when we have penetrated said hymen, uh, we've usually gotten fucked because this is a uh, a, a very evil state of, uh, of, of, of conditions right now. And uh, news, uh, freedom of expression, uh, uh, would, uh, it's very much under assault. Not just under assault, but under uh, pepper. So uh, check out my little documentary, Independent, uh, <laughs> Independent Artists versus Corrupt Cartels. I, I prove, I show, and not just with trauma movies, but I'm giving, and by the way, this is really interesting. Uh, you can tell I'm not a very good salesman for trauma, but the American, the American unions, the the white uh, uh, clothes shop American uh, unions, uh, fascist, um, they are um, suing. Uh, they are fighting against MGM and Amazon merging because they say that uh, the conglomerates are too vertically integrated. So uh, I've been talking about this for 50 years, and now you have the unions talking about it. So that tells you something. Well, I mean, the future, I'll not, well, if that's a bit of a dour, <laughs> a dour note. Well, the point is, the good news, I'm sorry, but uh, when I, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the only thing I, I got from Yale other than drugs and uh, Marvel comic books was um, I majored in Chinese studies. And uh, the big takeaway was uh, Taoism, a dualistic universe with the, where you have yin and yang, good and evil. You can't they're together. They're always together, uh, beautiful and ugly. 
um, the good news is that anybody can make a movie. The production of, of movies is um, democratized now. People are making movies for 2,000 pounds, 5,000 pounds, and they're very good. The problem is how do you get them to the public? Because uh, they, get a they get disemboweled uh, if, uh, when they are on Amazon or uh, YouTube, and the majors don't even, you know, answer the phone. So um, it, it's going to be uh, going to be hard. But you can at least make your own damn movie. In fact, I wrote a book called "Make Your Own Damn Movie." <laughs> Another one called "Direct Your Own Damn Movie." Make <laughs> your own damn movie. Sell your own damn movie. That's the best one. But the point is, you can do all that. And maybe you can take your Blu-ray uh, to conventions and sell it there, and and uh, Northumbria will will show it maybe, uh, or uh, and and maybe the next movie uh, you you got two movies now, and uh, you still have to work at McDonald's, but maybe eventually, slowly but surely, your films start bringing in a, a little more money, and then you can switch from McDonald's being part time. To uh, movies being full time and eventually, so I mean that's the hope. But I don't. I think it's going to be very, very difficult to, uh, to have any independent studios. It's just uh, uh, too uh, too costly these days. And the the brain set. Uh, you're right. Look at look at how exciting we are. How excited we are about uh, you know these uh, big 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 movies. Or how about the Oscar nominations? Did you see them? Minari? Hmm. Minari? Holy <laughs> Christ, what the hell was that? And how about the one that won Best Picture? Nomadland. Come on. You put that in the same category as, as previous Oscar winners? How does Minari stack up against Ben-Hur or, uh, or uh, Marty or, or Rocky? I mean, it's ridiculous. It's minor bullshit. So it, 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 I would say... Uh, Thank the good Lord for trauma, a beacon of, of uh, a beacon of light and inspiration to young people everywhere. And I think that is kind of the truth. I think that we we show that it is if stupid people like us can can uh, put their kids through uh, good universities and uh, and all that kind of stuff, then uh, anybody can do it. Well, well not very hard, very hard. And again, well, how grateful am I? To Vera Dika and to you for uh, uh, giving me a little bit of, uh, of love here. No question. Well, Lloyd, honestly, on that bombshell, and that was a bombshell, I think it's fair to say, <laughs> we're going to have to draw things to a close. I just want to say it's been a privilege getting the chance to, to chat with you. And uh, thanks to Wickham and Daniel for allowing me to do it. So thank you very much, Lloyd. It's been a, it's been a pleasure. Well, thank you, Daniel. Thank you, Wickham, uh, and especially Dr. Johnny. And um, thank you to our fans in the, in the UK who have kept uh, trauma alive because right now we basically have no distribution uh, uh, in the UK. Uh, so uh, we're grateful for our fans who have subscribed to Trauma Now. That's probably the only way you can get uh, the newer and better trauma movies. Trauma Now, it's the future, but now. <laughs>